Okay, so flu-like symptoms, oh my gosh. So many different types of complaints. It's like, what don't they complain of? Toe pain and flu-like symptoms, belly pain, flu-like symptoms. They could be there for uh, just a prescription refill and they'd be like, you know what, I kind of have some flu-like symptoms. They will tell you everything from fever, wheezing, coughing, sneezing, rhinorrhea, headache. I keep thinking of the Pepto-Bismol commercial, right? But what is it really? What is it? Is it an upper respiratory infection? Is it acute bronchitis? Is it actually the flu? It could it be something else? We're going to sort through all this. And the, how I sort through all of this is using a mnemonic called SLIT. Okay? I walk in slicing and dicing my patients during flu season. You know what that's like. You walk into your shift, let's say you're doing the later shift, and the waiting room is packed. And you just keep thinking to yourself, sick, not sick, mm, that person looks maybe sick, not sick, not sick. Not. And you just want to slice and dice and go through. But what are you looking for? You can apply your old CARTS mnemonic, right? Onset, location, duration, all those things. But I like this one. It's shorter, quicker, faster. Subjective, what are they telling you? Listen to their lungs. What do those sound like? That's going to tell you a lot. Do they look ill or do they look healthier than you do that day? And the timing, how long has this been going on for, which will play a key role in a lot of these. One of the big things with upper respiratory illnesses or URIs, these are short-lived illnesses. They don't look sick. Their lungs sound clear. Subjectively, they're like, eh, I don't feel good. But you know what? They can still kind of get through everything. And what they really want is a work note. And you shouldn't be feeling bad about giving people work notes. People need their jobs. You're their lifeline, literally. Give it to them. They usually don't have a high fever like you will in the flu. They won't say to you, I feel like I've been hit by a bus. They're telling you things that are kind of like, wah, wah, right? I feel bad for you, but I got the same thing, brother. All right? URI treatment is supportive. You need to rest. You need to get some good nutrition and hydration. The studies are proven that these are the only things that really work. We're going to talk about some of the over-the-counter stuff at the end of this talk, but right now I just want to buzz through a couple of them. Analgesics like Tylenol or Motrin, um, other decongestants and antihistamines and honey are really the only supportive treatments that are suggested. There is some literature on probiotics, as we've talked about a little bit, for gut health. Sleeping, antitussives for comfort, and saline rinses maybe zinc, maybe vitamin C, maybe echinacea. And I'm going to show you the literature on that in a minute. What the treatment does not include is a Z-pack, more antibiotics. They can cause a lot of harm, as Dr. Henry has already told us about. But what's a little different than just your average UI, URI, right? So the URI was just kind of like the head to the neck down. That's it, boom. Acute bronchitis is taking that a step further. Neck down to the chest. This is a chest cold, okay? These are the people that come in and say, I can't stop coughing. I feel like I'm going to pass out from my coughing. I can't sleep because I'm coughing. And again, subjectively, they're telling you these symptoms, but they don't, they're not really telling you anything else. They haven't had really super high fevers. They might have had some body aches, but the big consistent present thing is their cough. And remember, Diane and I were talking earlier in the question and answer, set these people up for success. You're not going to tell them, you know what, I'm going to fix you. You're going to feel better tomorrow, right? No, it's going to take two or three weeks to get better from this. But what's really happening in acute bronchitis? I like telling people this because when they have their cough, they're <coughs> I have a little bit myself from being in the casino, I feel like. But basically, you want to kind of draw them a little diagram, be like, this is what your bronchial looks like, and now I want you to hock a loogie onto this piece of paper, and that's what it looks like on the inside, okay? Don't really have them do that. That's really gross, and make sure you wash your hands. They are going to be a little bit hoarse, kind of like me right now. They might have a little bit of a wheeze, especially in the smokers, and one of the things that I know when people are really sick versus, hey, maybe this is just the bronchitis, is they still haven't stopped smoking. They're like, I don't feel good, but I could still smoke right? Things that you don't routinely do with acute bronchitis is take a chest x-ray. I would reserve this for your super sick patients or immunocompromised patients, so people that are, are kind of giving you an inconsistent story. You can't right, quite slit right through them. Or if they um, are hypoxic, you might want to consider getting a chest x-ray and make sure this isn't some kind of underlying pneumonia. 
and uh, your COPD patients, you certainly want to take more caution in. And again, the treatment for this, not antibiotics. There is some evidence that shows that a ZPAC or another antibiotic could potentially shorten the life of acute bronchitis, but for less than a day. And again, they can cause more harm than good. We actually have a piece of paper with recommendations for acute bronchitis in our hospital, and it does not include a ZPAC. What it does include is an MDI or albuterol, which is a great thing to help um, get, relieve the bronchospasms and relax those lungs. And I think that it is important to offer that to the patient, maybe dispense it from the ER if you can. All right, moving on, vaping-related illnesses. These are electronic cigarettes vaping-associated lung injuries, okay? You may have heard that the CDC called this a crisis. I think it's a little far-fetched that it is, but it is something that they wanted to spend their time on. And I think it's of good value to know about it because people are dying from it. I think that the best evidence we have is a couple of papers, one in particular that says that THC is related to this acute lung injury, and essentially people are getting THC products that are contaminated in some way. They're getting them from the gas station, they're getting them from overseas in China, and they're getting sick from them. Many of the cases, why this is making hot news is because they're young, they're male, otherwise healthy, and it's bothersome because the average age of this is about 21. So you know these people that come in that are like, again, they're like, they're used to smoking their vape, they're used to smoking their cigarettes, but you know they're sick because they said, I can't even smoke. That's how sick they are. What are you going to do for these people? Well, we haven't quite figured out the whole thing yet, but what we can tell you is to investigate the source of which they are smoking, stop smoking it, and try to quit altogether. The CDC does not recommend substituting vaporizing pens or e-cigarettes to help you quit smoking. That's not one of their recommendations. This is just citing one of the studies um, that they were looking at um, and additionally talking about some of the symptoms and the suggested treatment is really high dose steroids. High, high, high dose steroids has been showing some effect. But what's interesting is that when you get this patient that shows these bilateral infiltrates on their x-ray, you're kind of wondering like, well, where really is the source? I mean, it's just the patchy kind of whited out like, you know, everything, their blood cultures come back normal. This is a vaping associated lung injury. And these people die, they die quickly. Moving on to other things that kill you quickly, the flu. This slide is bright and purple and great, but it's grim and dire and depressing because there are still people that don't want to vaccinate against the flu. It makes me really sad. Um, but, you know, be the best advocate that you can in your community and uh, suggest that people get this, especially children. I added a new slide to this recently because there, there are some new recommendations regarding influenza. There is a new super high strength influenza vaccine. It's like top of the line jet fuel for anybody over the age of 65. So this is the more powerful, more protective. And according to a couple studies showing that it's 24% more effective than your standard dose, four times more effective. And that could potentially lower risk of hospital admissions. So, I, yeah, okay, I can do the math on that. Also, the CDC suggested that the live vaccine, remember the one that goes up the nose that people got so upset about for some time because they felt like it could cause the flu? That now is recommended in ages two to eight or the shot. So kids can get either or. The American College of Pediatrics, I read their announcement on this, and they said, eh, we're not really sure. I guess it's okay. It's not going to hurt anybody, but we want more evidence here. So I think in this case, if you're administering flu vaccines, you can offer one or the other um, for kids who really are adverse to getting shots. Um, you know, it's going to be uh, totally up to you there. I put this slide in here because I want to bring to your attention the flu stats, which are really cool if you're really nerdy and want to geek out like my buddy Ken Milne, who you'll meet tomorrow. You can look at some of the statistics, and you can look at it on updated uh, every hour if you want, if you're really that into it. You can look here, the really super light blue line that has the highest peak. Oh, let's try the, the zoom in. I heard that it doesn't always work. 
No. Oh, look, this one right here. Okay, that was last year's flu season. Excuse me, that was two years ago flu season, this light guy right here. This was last year's flu season, so we went down in the number of cases, but we still peaked around the same time. So this is a graph of time here, and the peaking part is the week in which the flu is prevalent. So if you want to see when you think you're going to start to head upward, you can check out the flu view on the CDC uh, government website. And this is a great surveillance report. Also tells you a lot about how many pediatric deaths there are, um, how many people over the age of 65 related to influenza there are. And it also talks about high-risk populations. This is just a list. The blue uh, portion in the top here, I'm really into this now, this magnifying. Doo -doo -doo, look at that. Whoa. Okay. So... This is a list of ones you're pretty much associating with average patient that you see every day. Some of these other ones you might forget about may have serious morbidity and mortality related to their problem, like our sickle cell patients when they get flu, liver disease patients, people with transplanted organs. You need to think about these people as high risk. Look at that cute little flu. It's a really smart virus. This is a smart virus that knows how to kill people. So remember, we're slitting these patients, we're thinking about what they're saying, we're listening to their lungs. Do they look ill? Yes, people who have the flu look ill. They're telling you they feel like, shit, they feel really bad. That you look at them and they're like crumbling into a little ball, like young people who are usually pretty healthy. Fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, body aches, sore throat, cough. How do you diagnose the flu? Now, I'm only going to say this one time, okay? You don't have to get a flu test to confirm the flu or treat the flu if you have a high suspicion. But if you really want to, you can get the PCR test, right? Very expensive. The rapid antigen testing can be done in 15 minutes to an hour. Of course, if you're trying to get that patient admitted to the floor, right, and the admitting team says to you, oh yeah, we can't take that patient until the flu test comes back negative because they know they just bought themselves an hour till shift change. But there's a much lower sensitivity to some of the PCR testing um, compared to uh, the rapid molecular assays and the viral culture. So almost all of these are send outs. So the rapid testing is 50 to 70% sensitive, which means false negatives are common. And sensitivity is improving with the newer tests, but 90% specificity, so false positives are uncommon. Oh, and I just wanted to mention that they're really the most reliable in the first couple of days of the illness. After that, it's kind of like after 48 hours, don't bother. Now, we mentioned this when a great national body like the CDC recommends something, we probably should listen. I'm not saying one way or another. It's your decision. You, you're going to be armed with the information. I'm completely unbiased here, but when, if you were in a court of law and someone ha, you know, says, oh, well, there's this great drug that could have prevented this death of the flu and you didn't give it, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, this is what the CDC says. If the test is positive for the flu, if you have symptoms that are less than 48 hours, there are no other contraindications, which we'll go over, um, then you should treat with antivirals. And that especially applies to high-risk patients that we talked about in the blue slide earlier. CDC guideline. So how do you treat them if you're going to treat them? Don't shoot the messenger, okay? There's Tamiflu, Relenza, and Rapavab. These are the doses. These are the considerations and age requirements. So, you know, when you're thinking about prescribing these, you can flip open your book right here, and this is what you can prescribe. They're both, excuse me, all three are effective against influenza A and B. There's some contraindications, um, and typically hospitalized patients are the ones that are getting the IV dose, as well as pregnant individuals. There's this really great new drug called Zofluza. It sounds like, you know, it's a circus drug or something, but, you know, this is, this, I'm not sure who really comes up with these names, but um, this is Biloxivir Marboxyl, and this is a single-dosed pill. There's the price right there, 30 to 150 bucks. And you can give it to anyone with uncomplicated flu uh, symptoms, uh, excuse me, flu diagnosis in ages 12 years or over. But again, they have to be symptomatic for less than 48 hours. 
I mean, how, do you, how much do you love the parent that comes in and says, well, you know, this one got sick on Thursday around like three o'clock and like I kind of felt sick like maybe four days ago and you're like, oh man. And then she's like, why can't we all get treated? And you're just like, wow, I, I just, the, you're going to have difficult cases like that and you're just going to have to figure out how to get through them if you can. This is also the dosing requirement. 40 to 80 kilograms is 40 milligrams. 80 kilograms or above is 80 milligrams. Easy peasy. What about some side effects? This is, out without, this is not without risk. 14% of people can get GI symptoms or a rash. That's one of the big side effects that can occur. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, headache, nosebleeds. The list goes on and on and on. In fact, there was a study that looked at some neuropsychiatric issues in Japanese adolescents after they received antivirals. I like to always put the category pregnancy here because that's important to your practice as well. Um, again, pregnant patients should be receiving this because they're considered high risk. Antiviral contraindications. Pretty much every drug, if you're suicidal or have some kind of mental illness or delirium, like, excuse me, not mental illness, if you're suicidal or you potentially have an acute delirium or are confused, this is not a medicine that you should be giving. Use extreme caution in renal failure patients. This is someone that you should definitely be using shared decision making with and talking to your hospitalist. Usually these people are coming in if they're ill. The bottom line, and Ken Milne does a great podcast on a couple of different papers re uh, related to the flu, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, except that be skeptical, okay? I think that you need to look at some of the evidence and then decide what works for you. And every patient is again going to be different. So that leaves us here between a rock and a hard place. This is in my department. Every day I look at this and kind of shake my head and say, which way am I going to go today? Anybody know this girl? This is the Redskins cheerleader that said that she started walking backwards after she got the flu shot, like Michael Jackson, which is a great slot machine, by the way, if anybody wants to play that. This lady later told everybody that it was just a lie, it was a hoax, and that also she was having some mental instability. Thousands of people believed her and didn't vaccinate their kids, their family members. People died because of this lady. That sucks. That's all I can say about that. So let's talk about some fake news. Let's just get it right out of the way. The flu shot and the nasal spray caused the flu. False. Eh. The flu shot does not cause the flu. The nasal spray does not cause the flu. The flu shot causes body aches and a low grade temperature. Okay, I'll give you a maybe on that. But if you look at some of the studies with um, saline injection and these randomized studies versus the flu shot, they both kind of felt achy, all right? So a shot is a shot is a shot. The Guillain, uh, excuse me, the shot can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, possibly. But I'm gonna read you the statistic here. One to two cases per one million. The death from the flu rates are much higher. More fake news. Children who have been vaccinated before, excuse me, children who have never been vaccinated before only need one flu shot, false. The American Academy of Pe Pediatrics says you need to have two, and if you miss them, you need to make it up. The flu shot works right away. Eh, false, two weeks. So those of you who've just got your shot before you came to Vegas thinking you'd be protected, I'm sorry. Egg allergy cannot get the flu shot, also false. People with egg allergies can. 1.31 out of a million are the chances of having anaphylaxis reaction. More myth busting. I love this one that Diane gave me. You swallow about one liter or a quart of snot a day. Ding, 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 true. You try to tell um, the grandmothers that come in to see you that milk consumption shouldn't be done during colds. Um, you know, there's no evidence really backing that. It's just dogma. And the color of the sputum means absolutely nothing. I don't care if it's green, orange, pink, purple, or sparkly. The only color I really care about is red blood. Hey, this is my drawer at home. I have about 15 of these. I know where everything is, though, OK? Everything. So when you go to the grocery store or the pharmacy, you're inundated with just this line, the slew of medications that you can have, colors and shapes and sizes and flavors and textures and psychedelic uh, uh, reactions from dextromethamorphin. I mean, there's all this great stuff you can choose from. 
Which ones are going to work? Well, I put together a couple slides telling you just that. And I'm going to quickly summarize a lot of them because I know we don't have a lot of time, but you're going to get what you need from this. Sudafed works, okay? It's a great drug. Makes you feel a little hyped up. But the more effective version of this is Sinex, the one that goes in the nose. Okay, that's a really good one. And there are studies that help um, prove this. Actually, one other really important thing about Sudafed is that people who have uh, ear, ears that are more prone to otitis are going to have a better benefit for this. So something to think about, someone who had lots of ear problems as children, and some of those um, uh, teenage kids could take Sudafed as long as they know that they're going to be bouncing off the walls. Avoid it in the younger patients. Phenylephrine, which is neosinephrine, or oxymetallazine, which is afrin, are also both great. They make you feel like this. I'm clear until they don't and have rebound effect. So one of the big things about these two things is that you want to avoid long-term use of this, no, no more than 72 hours, or you're going to get this rhinitis, um, medicamentosa, and you also want to caution the use in children. Like, don't tell mom, you know, who, tell her that she has to suck up the snot from the kid's nose, okay? She's just going to have to do that. Put the thing in and suck out the snot. No sprays for them up of, of the nose of neosinephrine or oxymetallazine. He's so cute. Look at him. All right. Again, lots of actually there were some public service announcements on the TV about the rebound effect, which was really cool for us. What else can you put up your nose? Well, you know, a lot of people may choose a, glut a glucocorticoid nasal spray, but honestly, this is only good if you've had symptoms greater than two weeks. So sinusitis, for example. A great treatment for them if they truly have a sinusitis is the Flonase, okay? But remember, this can cause really dry nares and epistaxis, so you need to caution that for people. In fact, I tell them after they squirt it up their nose, they should take a little um, uh, bacitracin or Vaseline, whichever they like, and just kind of put it up there. So, oh, look, I just picked my nose in front of all of you. And then that way they don't have to get um, dry nose. You know, how come every time someone wants to talk about, like, someone picking their nose or, like, if something's going on down here, they have to show you? I mean, I go to, like, present a patient, I'm like, she has having pain right here. <laughs> All right, chromalin sodium intranasal inhalation, also shown as a mast cell stabilizer to be effective to help control rhinorrhea. This is great for little kids. And again, I love giving parents something to do that actually works. This may actually have their symptoms resolved faster. What else? I would avoid Alka-Seltzer products because it's just a very pricey way of giving you aspirin with a bunch of chemicals. I also would avoid NyQuil and other sleep aid products because it's just another polypharmacy. I would say if you want to take something, take pure dextromethamorphan, and we're going to get to that in a second, and add a little Benadryl, right? You don't need a mixed product. Get, stop feeding these drug companies that are making these. Find out what the drug is that works. Choose only that drug and give that. It's just like I never prescribe Percocet. Actually, I shouldn't say never. I rarely prescribe Percocet because I want people to max out on Tylenol before they take a stronger medicine like oxycodone. If I'm going to prescribe oxycodone, I'm going to give the oxycodone and only the oxycodone. Combine only when necessary. Antihistamines might help with sleep, but have little decongestant effect in the studies. Zinc. Some studies show that if you take it early enough, it will work. The problem is, is that the spray version of this, the FDA issued a public health warning about it. It can cause permanent anosmia, and that is complete loss of smell. So if you're going to use this, the syrup or the lozenges are better. And if you didn't know, National Anosmia Day is in February. For more natural paths, echinacea, I actually don't mind this. If you are somebody that takes this, you're like, I feel great, I feel great, and then you're like so in tune with your body where you're like, one of my cells is off. My white blood cell count, I know, just went from like 6 to 6.2. With a small shift, I know it's getting there. There's a few bands coming up. I just... I know that I'm getting sick, and I'm going to take some echinacea. So the studies show that actually can help prevent a more serious illness from coming on. Um, excuse me, it can prevent a cold, but not lessen their symptoms. Okay, so you might prevent it altogether, but 
not necessarily lessen the symptoms. And it can cause GI upset. Um, <laughs> I love this may cause cancer. It's like, okay, well, you know, um, it's, that was one of the side effects. And, you know, the commercials are the fold-outs that are like, blah, 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 may cause cancer, by the way, feel better. Other things, vitamin C, an inconsistent truth. I, you know, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about the studies in vitam about vitamin C, but it is so complex. Um, what I want to say about it is that people that are typically healthy individuals, and when I say healthy, I'm talking like s the studies that were done on marathon runners, people that are hiking mountains, um, all-star basketball players, when they take vitamin C, they get better for whatever reason. But do you think they probably would have just gotten better anyway? I mean, they're pretty healthy people. Um, so I don't know how I feel about the studies in general. All I can tell you is what some of them said. And if you take vitamin C and you're super healthy and you take high doses, you actually might not get so sick. The problem is if you take a lot of vitamin C, you can give yourself a kidney stone. So like your average person who maybe goes to the gym once a year on New Year's Day, <laughs> vitamin C is not going to help them. How about essential oils, rubs, and Vicks? Oh, you smell so good, right? Life's cure to every problem. Vicks Vapor Rub, delicious smelling. You can buy a $20 bottle of lavender this big. Like I remember one time I bought it and I was trying to put a few drops in the bathtub. I dropped the whole bottle and I was like, well, I guess I'll be sleeping tonight, right? Well, you could smell bad and put onions in your socks, right? How many people have you heard about doing that? No evidence, fake news. Antitussives, so let's end with a little bit of other just important things about treating your symptoms. So treating a cough with dextromethamorphin is effective. It's, it's pretty good. I mean, in my opinion, when I take it, I feel great. It quiets my cough. But when you look at the studies, the placebo patients felt better also. So I think this is going to be patient specific. And if you want to give them something to suppress their cough, this may work. But what looks, excuse me, what is better are the uh, benzonitate or Tesalon pearls. Those are useful, but you don't need to overdose them on this. 100 milligrams three times a day is enough. You don't need to give them the 200 milligram dosing. Albuterol can help. And coding, mixed reviews on coding. Certainly don't want to give it to any child under the age of 12 years old. Now, I always make the joke that Jim used to give me shots of tequila with my coating, but then the authorities might come after him. Children and antitussives. The American Academy of Pediatrics suggests that quieting a cough is really more so for the parent than it is for the child, okay? And if it's keeping the parent up at night, that's the question I like to ask. Honey is something that can really help. There are excellent studies about honey helping quiet coughs in adults and children. Just no child under one should receive honey. And again, as I mentioned, codeine is very dangerous in our, our young population. Here's a couple of studies related to the honey. Um, my daughter still likes it, and I think some nights she just says to me, like, uh, uh, Mom, I have a cough. Uh, 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 can I have some honey? And I'm like, all right, you can have it. Guafenicin and mucomyst, acetylcysteine, only FDA approved um, expectorants. The thought here is that it aids in the flow of the respiratory tract secretion and gets them out so people don't develop pneumonias and, and disgusting lungs filled with the snot. I like a little bit of visual help sometimes, so if you want to know how all of these medications are working, you can take a look at this diagram. And I want you to always caution these five things. People with hypertension, Decongestants can cause high blood pressure. So you're not going to be giving these people pseudoephedrine, ephedrine, phenylephrine, oxymetallazine. You have to worry about prolonged QT. We've touched on this a couple of times. What about mixing drugs? That can be bad, right? We don't want to keep prolonging their QT. And acute narrow angle glaucoma. People who have this and take antihistamines can raise their eye pressure. And remember, we already talked about cautioning polypharmacy. Antibiotics cause diarrhea and dehydration, and you should consider a probiotic in anyone that you ended up prescribing an antibiotic in. This is a list of all the other terrible things that can go wrong with your patient, right? But these aren't the patients that you're like feeling pretty good about. These are patients that are looking very sick and you, they need a bigger workup. 
Some med legal stuff, we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, this is just a reminder that you should create some standardized documentation for your patient when you're discharging them. The very, very last lecture that we give called Odds and Ends in EM is going to cover some of our disposition, like actually what is suggested to write in your paper. Um, so we're going to go over that on the last day. So stay tuned for more on that. And again, give these people work notes. Here's a summary of what's effective for the common cold. You don't see onions on our uh, effective list, right? But if you really want to smell stinky, here's some cases. Um, that you can take a look at. These are going to be your average patient that you see and, you know, some suggestions for what you can do. And again, the man flu is a real diagnosis, and I pray for them every day. <laughs>